Welcome to Amplify, the personal brand business show. Today on the show, Bob is speaking with Jeremy Pope. I've found the lower ticket you go, the more systematic you have to be in marketing that because you cannot afford to put personal time into selling each of these $35 items or these $400 items or whatever they are. So you have to have a system that does it for you. Systems are difficult to build. They're difficult for sophisticated people. How much more so for people who are in startup stage? High ticket is so much easier to sell and to fulfill. Hi there, and welcome back to Amplify, the personal brand and business show. My name is Bob Gentle, and every week I speak to incredible people who share their secrets to building, marketing, and monetizing their expertise and the mindset you need for your business to grow and thrive. If you're new to the show, then while you still have your device in your hand, take a second to subscribe. That way you won't miss a single thing. And if you're watching on YouTube, which I am trying to get into the discipline of uploading on YouTube as well, subscribe, but also give this episode a thumbs up as that is really what YouTube is looking for. And if you have any questions that come up, ask them in the comments. So this week, we are speaking about the beating heart of your business, the lifeblood of any enterprise. And it really boils down to this. If you're not growing, you're dying. And if you want to grow, you're going to need to have to sell. And a lot of business owners, really smart people, hate selling. So I never get tired of talking about sales and selling. And this week, I am thrilled to welcome Jeremy Pope from Sales Call Overhaul. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure already. So Jeremy was referred to me by a client to speak on the podcast. That for me is the golden ticket. Anybody that's referred to me by a client to come on the podcast, I know it's going to be good. And you were referred by Will Sampson. And Will is a really smart guy. He so, is. Um, I always have to pay attention to Will. I've learned to trust his introductions as well. Yeah. So for the the listener or the viewer who's meeting you for the first time, and I'm not far off that, can you maybe just start by telling us a little bit about who you are, where you are, and the kind of work you do? Sure. Who I am, I am a child of God. Where I am, I am in Asheville, North Carolina. And the kind of work I do has changed a lot over the years. I got into consultative selling my, my first sales job was working for myself in college, my first year of college, actually my only year of college. Uh, but I was selling door to door. I was selling door to door to real estate attorneys, my client, my uh, title search services so that they could close on a deal and people could get loans. So that was my first exposure to the world of selling. I had done construction before that. I had done farm work before that, et cetera. But it was, uh, it was a new thing. And I quickly learned that a tie and a jacket were not necessary in the hot South Georgia summer or <laughs> which the hot South Georgia summer lasts about eight months out of the year. So, uh, it was full swing every moment of every day. I've sold a lot of different things from health insurance to life insurance to mortgages to homes to vegetable slicers that was that was almost not selling that was pitching that was being a barker that was showmanship i guess you could say but what really got me into the kind of selling where i really started learning what i was doing was when i became a clinical hypnotist and oh. i got into hypnosis because i needed memory help. I had undiagnosed ADHD as, a, as an adult. And well, now it's diagnosed, but I still have ADHD. <laughs> so I got into hypnosis for memory improvement. I kept forgetting where I put things. It worked for me. I started doing it for a few other things. Then I started doing it for a client and I uh, started helping people quit smoking. And then I went and trained an NLP uh, practitioner, so neuro-linguistic programming, and learned the tools. And they started trying to teach, you know, overall mindsets and frameworks, kind of everybody has their own theology of selling, I guess you could say, their own philosophy of the principles of selling. 
And I found that there was no structure like a, an overall NLP framework. There were tools available for use in almost any framework, but there is no cohesive framework. And so I started realizing I had to develop my own there. So I, I was a clinical hypnotist for 11 years and I learned a tremendous amount about persuasion. It's my belief that about 50% of persuasion is the same, regardless of whether you call it sales, management, leadership, parenting, romance, coaching, or any other version of persuasion or influence. About half of it, maybe, maybe more, maybe less, is, is the same. The principles are there. And then the details, that changes depending on what are we trying to accomplish here? What type of sale are we making? Is this a parenting sale? Is this a coaching sale? Is this a romantic sale? What are our long-term and short-term goals? What is the funnel here? All that stuff ends up mattering deeply. But I have found that there are, my audience with Sales Call Overhaul is pretty specifically, we, we even say it in our culture documents that they are giver founders. And so givers have certain types of problems in their, in their selling and in their business. Even they tend to have certain types of boundary issues, not all of them, but you know, they consistently imposter syndrome pops up. Some types of people pleasing boundary issues pop up and you have to help people draw healthy boundaries our minds are very sneaky places. And the smarter you are, the sneakier your own mind is with you. Just being able to expose that stuff and create transparency and integrity internally in a founder is a big deal. Oh, I'm way off on a tangent. Getting back to the history. my I, I went and worked for a company called Traffic and Funnels in 2016 as their first client success director. And that was when I started building out tons and tons of funnels, webinar funnels at first, like Facebook ad to webinar to sales call and did a lot of that, then branched out on my own and created third party sales teams for the same types of entrepreneurs, agencies, consultants, expert service providers, and SaaS founders. And that's, that's still the type of folks that I work with. I call them my aces. And the only thing that's changed is what am I doing for them? and move much more into the coaching arena these days. But that's kind of what I'm up to. So that was actually a wonderful introduction. I have oh, so many questions. Okay. But before I get into that, what I love about who I'm meeting is when you talk sales training or funnels and things like this, there's a, part, there's a certain type of person that you'll typically expect to meet. And it would yeah. be stylized as the classical bro marketer. I knew you were going to say that. Yes, you're right. Where else would I go? And that's mm. not who I'm meeting, which is wonderful. And I think for the, my audience, this is what they need to hear because mm. I could go out and get a bro marketer to come and talk about sales on the podcasting. And I'm ser on the podcast and I'm serving nobody mm. because nobody likes those people other than other bro marketers. And <laughs> neither you or I work for them. Right. So that's a wonderful place to start. Understanding human beings, hypnosis and NLP gives you a wonderful way to navigate the human condition, to understand the soul. I've been very fortunate in that, yes. Yeah. And in identifying the, the giver founders, it's a very particular kind of person. That's the antithesis mm -hmm. of the bro marketer. So you've identified who you want to work with. And you pretty much described me, imposter syndrome. I mean... I know oh, my wow. way around my, my personality now. And yeah. we spoke a little bit about that before we started recording. That I think mm. you and I have an awful lot in common about, I think, understanding yourself is one of the prerequisites to growth. And yeah. that's, for a lot of business owners, the hardest thing. I, I found that businesses, the maturity of a business matches the maturity of the founder in each area. And it doesn't always manifest the same way. It, like it can, it can trick you into thinking that the problem is a different type of problem. And you have to, that's, that's what a good coach is for a lot of times, as I'm sure you found like, what's the problem with my personal branding? Well, if they knew the answer, they wouldn't be asking you, right? So you, you've seen the deeper patterns. When we're talking about building an avatar, we talk about 
the disease, the pain from the disease, and then how they yell about that pain, the expression of that pain in their own words. There's three different levels to it. And I don't hear nearly enough marketers talk about this on the founder level. You hear a lot of people talking about it a couple levels up. Once once they're working with 10 to $50 million a year businesses, this is a common type of thing. You, you have the bandwidth to devote to it. But people need expertise in their corner to expose their internal stuff to them. And when you have a business owner that is having a maturity crisis, that business is in crisis, guaranteed. Fish rot from the head down, as they say. And so I found, even speaking to the bro marketer issue, I found that I can find budding givers in the bro marketer space. And it's just because they don't know any better yet but they want to be a giver. Some of them, some of them, they want to be a giver. Like they don't identify with I'm a wolf or I'm a shark or something like that. Like that's not the animal they would choose. And so uh, the, I, I found some budding givers in that field, but it's not, it's not a lot. It's more people who feel forced into that certain mold, that click funnels identity, the rah, rah, rah kind of thing. Yeah. And even your tone of voice is, almost anti-bro marketer, the, the peaceful, the, the soothing tones. <laughs> like it's a, you, you can feel it in almost every aspect. So I think I want to talk about mental models and mm. that stuff maybe in a little while. I want to talk about, first of all, sales and selling. And okay. in particular, the sales call. I think mm. when I meet a lot of business owners, they've been almost, especially at the small stage. When I say small, it doesn't necessarily mean low revenue. It's just they don't need a high volume in order to achieve their goals. Yeah. Or there may be early stage, pre-100,000, let's call it. Yeah. There's this mindset that we, we've been tricked into a lot of the time thinking that everything needs to be focused on scale at, at the beginning. So Ooh. information products for a couple of yeah, dollars that's nasty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or membership sites at $35 or mm -hmm. courses oh, Yeah, for early stage businesses. These are quite hard to achieve momentum on because you don't have They're the audience. So difficult. I've found the lower ticket you go, the more systematic you have to be in marketing that because you cannot afford to put personal time into selling each of these $35 items or these $400 items or whatever they are. So you have to have a system that does it for you. Systems are difficult to build. They're difficult for sophisticated people. How much more so for people who are in startup stage? High ticket is so much easier to sell and to fulfill because if you need it to be, like my coaching deliverable is I show up on Zoom once a week and I draw on the, my Miro whiteboard with digital crayons. That's it. And that's how I do all my coaching with Ben, my business partner. It's so much easier to go high ticket. And, and yeah, that's a nasty trap. Ben and I were talking about that just the other day. I'm glad you're talking about that too. Yeah. And I think I, I see it all the time that that's where people think they need to go because that's where a lot of the people who you might, I can't think of the word of them. I'm going to go, so I'm going to say the gurus. The role models. A lot of the, lot mm -hmm. of the gurus make their money by teaching how to sell at scale. Yeah. But actually, it's not what most businesses need at the beginning. Right. But what that does mean is if you're going to be selling a higher ticket product, you can't do it through automation. It's done through relationship. It's typically going to happen through a conversation. So yeah. people need to suck it up and embrace. They're going to need to be having sales conversations. And so they're yeah. going to need to get good at those. So I guess there's a few different people we could speak to here. Mm -hmm. The first person we could speak to is you've never done any sales conversations. You're maybe brand new in business. You know some people, so you're going to have two challenges. Challenge number one is how do you start conversations with strangers? Mm -hmm. And conversation number two is how do you turn that conversation into a conversation about what you do for money? Yeah. So what advice might you offer that person? The first bit is almost exactly what you've said. Break it out 
into into segments. I found one of the biggest coaching things, the the biggest gifts I can give someone as a coach is helping them break out a problem into its component pieces. For instance, anytime that I see a business owner, and this doesn't matter if it's Jeff Bezos or whether it's someone at the $200,000 a year level, or it doesn't matter. If they're in overwhelm, they're combining problems in their head into one feeling. So let's break the problems apart so we can feel differently about them. So we're talking about three separate components here. I would break it even further than just the two you mentioned. I would say you've got the list building and lead generation. So that might be scraping or that might be avatar development. Well, it has to be avatar development. You've got your outreach process. Often people at the very beginning of the process are, they're needing to do outreach and that's cool. It's great. You can build 30 or 40% of a of a billion dollar a year business based on outreach. So there's nothing wrong with outreach. It's very uncomfortable for a lot of givers because outreach feels very takey a lot of times. And so you must transform that into a giver process. I talk a lot with my people about what's the giver process that we want to use here. Then once you have a sales call or a strategy call or a clarity call or a breakthrough call or a whatever you want to call it call, or if you might have a process where you have an appointment setting call, maybe a 10 or 15 minute quick discovery qualification call, and then a real strategy call after that, just make sure that you're treating each part of your process as its own piece. That's very important because you need to be able to measure your conversion at each step of that process. So there's the systematic elements and there's the technique elements, and there's the mindset elements that allow you to perform those techniques well. In our sales call overhaul process, we do several call reviews. So send in the call recording, we review it, break it down, tell you everything that needs to change. But that's not the final fix. A lot of times people are doing something not because they don't know what to do, but they can't bring themselves to do it right. Mm -hmm. And so we do belief buster sessions. This comes back to the clinical hypnosis and the NLP days. Uh, and, and anybody who's done Russell Brunson's epiphany bridge webinar style for themselves, they'll see the same kind of thing. Like webinars are designed, good webinars, they're designed to address objections over and over and over and just shatter unhealthy or limiting beliefs around the thing. And so we have to break down unhealthy beliefs around selling or around your business or around the product or your ability to fulfill the product. Like you never know exactly where it's going to come up, but there are, there are certain patterns that do come up frequently. And then you address those and you rebuild healthy beliefs instead. So I guess that's two different ways of breaking it down is break it down via the pieces of the process, the funnel itself, if you will, and yes, I do consider outreach to be a type of funnel and then break it down by the type of work that has to be done. It's process and, and asset building work. It's technique and like delivering the technique, the performance part of things. And then it's the internal work so that you can accomplish the other two. That, if I had known that early, I would have operated my businesses very differently. I would have sold at much higher prices. I would not have had the failures that I've had, but I mean, that's the growth process. You know, a lot of growth is through failures. So I, I don't begrudge that in any way. I may have been too abstract there. Was that the kind of answer you were looking for? Or do you want me to get more detailed on that? No, I think that was a good answer. I think okay. the detail really comes when you need to be specific for a specific person. Sure. And I I'm happy to do that if you've got something in mind. We have other places to go. Okay, got it. What I liked was breaking down the process. I think mm. that that's a really important aspect. I think also business owners, I think there's always a desire that you just open the door, throw open the shutters and people will come and walk by your store and think, that's pretty, I'm going to buy that. Mm. And then they come and ask you, may I please buy your product and with their credit card in their hand, it just doesn't work like that, unfortunately. 
It does. A lot of the time, you need to be proactive. Yeah. Think about everything that store, that retail store had to do to have someone walk in the door and buy their product. They had a lot of setup to do. I am in awe of people who can think about what color are the baseboards painted in my retail store. Like I do not have that level of detail available in my mind. I like funnels. I like online. A big part of that is because I have very little work to do to set things up. This room right here, this is the only camera ready portion of this room. This is my kitchen and living room. (laughs) And I don't have to worry about any of it except for what's on camera right here. But I mean, I don't have to think about where I put my retail store because I don't have one. But that retail store owner had to put it in the right place to get traffic. That's a big deal. And we don't, until we're doing it, we don't think about the granularity of the problem solving that has to happen to really get it done. That's the difference between someone who's done it and someone who just talks about it or thinks about it. Yeah. I think kind of where I was coming from is Hmm. traffic or leads, they don't happen by themselves. Right. And again, lots of people would love to think in the beginning, it could be Facebook ads or people will just come through your content. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested actually to hear from you because you work with lots of business owners on the lead generation side of things as well, I'm guessing. Sure. From your perspective, an early stage solopreneur business, here's a question I ask a lot of people and you could probably give a really good answer. For most businesses, opportunity can come through outbound sales activity or Mm -hmm. it can come through content marketing, it can Mm -hmm. come through ads, or it can come through relationships. From the healthy early stage businesses that you can see these guys are going to fly What do you see that breakdown as, or where should people be going first? I like that question so much. I like the way you asked it too. The people who fly, they're heavy on outbound at first, or they are, they have a leg up. They have a cheat code on funnel building and they are well capitalized to start with. They have cash reserves. So if they do not have cash reserves and they're going to fly, they're going to be doing a lot of outbound. They're going to be moving very fast. My business partner, Ben, and I have started recently, we've categorized things for ourselves because we're we're team lean. We do not need a bunch of people to run two-on-one coaching program, you know? And we've divided our categories of work into run pipeline, Uh, Build assets, fulfill, and then admin is number four priority. We literally put it physically, visually on our Miro board at the bottom of the list so that we don't get tied up in useless BS. Run pipeline is number one. And that is where 70 to 80% of a business owner's focus is going to have to be as they get started. Agents, I work with a lot of digital marketing agency owners right now, and I I like a lot of other spaces as well, expertise-based spaces, but the marketing agency owners, they have a leg up on this equation because there are so many white label service providers for Facebook ads, for Google, for SEO, for all that stuff. They're able to stay out of fulfillment more easily than an expert can. So that's kind of a cheat code in the agency world. They've got their own difficulties, of course. Every business has its own difficulties and, and cheat codes, but that's they tend to be able to focus more on client acquisition than some others do. If they're spending but that that ratio is consistent. If you're spending 70 to 80 percent of your time on acquisition until you are, I'd say bills paid plus a hundred percent or plus 150%, something like that, Mm -hmm. then you're spending your time generally wisely. I I teach a concept called spark time. So strategy production, I can't share my screen in this, can I? No, sorry. Okay. I'll I'll show it to you afterwards, or maybe we move over to zoom and I'll, I'll show it to you then. But spark time is a It's a founder time management, and it's the five kinds of founder time. Strategy, production, artistry, rejuvenation, and knowledge building. 
And then I break that out in subcategories, but I say, look, if you're, if you're spending less than 10% of your time in any of these as a business owner, you're out of balance and it's okay to be a little bit out of balance on client acquisition at first, but not for a very long time. You need to get to that bills paid plus 150% revenue. So 250% of the revenue that pays the bills, pl- including taxes, that's that's the number I'm talking about there. But once you get to that point, you shouldn't be spending more than 60% of your time on any one of those five areas. And the way that you break out, should you be outbound, should you be inbound, whether that's a referral network, I, I'd say referrals is a hybrid. That's a hybrid of outbound and inbound. You're reaching out to your referral partners and they're having people reach into you. So that's the only one where I, I wouldn't say it, it's clearly in a category. Um, you can make it work with any of these, with, with content, with inbound ads, with referral strategies, or with just cold outreach. And a lot of it goes to the zone of genius that is for you and the speed at which you need to move. If you've got deadlines, you're going to be out of your zone of genius sometimes. That's okay. Do the unsexy, the ditch digging, the the hard, sweaty, uncomfortable, backbreaking work for a little while, but then stop as soon as you can. I don't, so, maybe that's too broad of an answer. I don't know. No, it really wasn't. I think what okay. I, what I really hoped to hear was exactly what you said, because okay. I think a lot of business owners kind of wished that the sales would just take care of themselves. And mm. a lot of the time business owners can build their business because they're really nice people. People do refer to them. They are mm. fairly well known in their communities or their networks. And so being half hearted with a bit of marketing it can work. And that leads you into the false sense of security that I'm a bit of a Ron Burgundy. I'm kind of a big deal. People will just come and not realize that if they just put a little bit of time being uncomfortable and being proactive in their outbound activities, building some systems and some processes around that. Yeah. The magic can really start to happen. It's uncomfortable for a little while, but you can make that quite comfortable quite quickly. And I guess what I wanted to hear from you, because you'd mentioned giver processes, Mm. but we didn't get into what that actually is. Okay. Because I sense there's something important in there. Oh, there's so many important things in there. (laughs) Yeah. So for instance, in a, a giver outreach process, for instance, for instance, for instance, we can, we can say, all right, what feels bad about this? I do a lot of, I teach my biz owners feelings-based KPIs. KPIs are so hard for so many business owners to create. And just here's, here's the quick tip on those. If someone only did what is written on the page and no more, do you feel like they could do an A plus job? Do you feel like they could do an amazing job if they did not go above and beyond what's on this page? No. Okay. Keep writing. That works for job descriptions, that works for projects, that works for a lot of things. But that's kind of the core of the feelings-based KPI method that I teach. So we we just ask that kind of question about the process. So what do I hate about outreach? Do I hate looking things up? Some people, that's it. Like they don't like research. Okay, that's fine. Let's buy the research. Do I hate the feeling of bothering people at their job, at their LinkedIn, at their Facebook, at their cell phone number, at their whatever. Okay. Well, why do I feel like I'm, then we do five whys. Once we find the the yes answer, this is the part I hate. Or do I feel like I, I don't have anything to offer them. Like I'm taking, like that's the core of it. A lot of times I feel like a taker when I do this, I'm asking them for something, but I'm not giving value okay, how do I give them something that's useful to them? Almost all the time, that boils down to, I do not know my avatar well enough. I tell all my clients, if you invent an imaginary avatar, you will get paid in imaginary dollars. You cannot invent a person aside from the tried and true method of making a baby. That's the only way you get to invent a person. And even then, 
you don't get a whole lot of say in how that personality turns out, right? That they are their own person. So we we don't play imaginary games and expect to get paid in real dollars. We discover our avatar. We discover the disease they have, the pain that comes from that disease, and the way they express that pain in their words. And we don't force them to translate it into, into Jeremy language or into biz owner language. We want them to be able to think in their own words. That's part of the gift that we give them is we join them in their world. We speak business Spanish instead of speaking business English. And, and we be clumsy about it because they feel at home in their world. We join them instead of trying to force them to join us. I, I imagine there are a lot of things you would have to say about personal brand around that. And I'd love to hear from you about that. But there are a couple of a couple of consistent tactical things that come from giver outreach processes. So what does this person really care about? If you are getting in touch with them and you're concerned that you're bothering them, you just don't know what their problem is. Because if you really knew what their pain was, you would know 100% without a doubt that they're going to be glad to talk to you. Now, they might not be glad to talk to you right now. They might be busy, but they might be glad to talk to you in a week or something like that. But if you are speaking to a problem they actually have rather than a problem you've decided you want to solve, they're going to be happy to talk to you. That's the fundamental thing about offer building is know your audience, know your avatar. If you don't have that, you're going to have a hard time finding product to market fit. You're going to have a very hard time ever going past the half a million dollar a year range, like freelancer with friends, genius with a thousand hands. It, it Once you get to, and not everybody wants to grow beyond that. Like that's, that's a perfectly reasonable method of doing business, but the empire builders, the growth mode business owners who are like, okay, let's hit $2 million a year next year kind of thing. That is, you're never going to get there without product market fit. And you're never going to be able to make sales easy without the offer that makes sense for your audience. So that's the biggest gift that you can give is just, does the offer actually solve their problem? And can you communicate that in their own words? Then there are a lot of small things that you can do to be a giver and you can get wild with these too. You can literally send them a gift. I just went to Nicaragua on a mission trip to the poorest region of Nicaragua and we're partnering with a ministry down there called Deeply Rooted Grounds. It's deeplyrootedgrounds.com. They run a feeding program for about 6,000 children. And for some of these kids, it's the only meal each day that they get. Like they are destitute. It, it is, it's a shocking country to visit. And it was, it was very humbling for me to, to go there. But I'm looking at this and I go, okay, if I send a qualified prospect, a $20 bag of coffee in the mail. There's zero chance I'm not getting their attention. There's zero chance they're not reading the little card on the front of it. There's zero chance they're not going to be interested in this. There's zero chance that they're not going to consider giving me a call back. So literally giving them a physical item is one way that you can be a giver. I used to have a process in my client onboarding where I would, uh, I would pick out two or three books that I thought the client would like, and I would stuff a small safe full of paper, a battery operated, like a key code safe. I'd order a safe from Amazon and ship it to me, put in the batteries, change the code, stuff it full of books, slap a neon orange index card on the top with tape and then ship it out to them. This whole process took me about $200, $250. The shipping was like 70 bucks to send a safe in the mail, you know. But Amazon Prime, it got it to me for free. So I, I would send that over and say, I can't wait to give you the code for this on our onboarding call. Now, I will gladly send a qualified prospect, a $200 item, a safe in the mail with that neon orange card on it saying, 
I'd love to give you the code for this safe. Call me? Like, I get callbacks from that. There's there's just no chance. What I love about that mm-hmm. is you can you can buy Facebook ads. Once you've been running through them for a while, you have a cost per acquisition. You know what your customers cost you. Yes. But you have exactly the same process, but with a gift yes. or some other very tangible physical object. And mm-hmm. you can establish the same cost per acquisition. You've but hit the nail on the head. Mm-hmm. It, it, that, co- acceptable cost of client acquisition, ACA is what I call it. That is the number that you absolutely must know. And so you have to know your internal costing to provide the service or the product. As soon as you know that number, you can convert that into dollars. So gift dollars, time dollars, like labor dollars on outreach, sales commission dollars, Facebook ad dollars, any other kind, like you can work with that budget as long as you know that number. Yeah. There's Mike Michalowicz. He wrote a book called Get Different recently. Yep. And for me, this fits so elegantly in there because I love Mike. you can do all the same things everybody else is doing, but we become blind to it. If something yeah. actually turns up at my door, I'm going to remember that probably for years because nobody does it. You will get attention. So if you've done the work to make sure this person mm-hmm. is a viable prospect for you and they're potentially mm-hmm. in your A-list, why not build your business around your A-list? It takes a little yeah. bit of time and effort to work out who these people are. And yeah, I, it's, it's a I have very strong to- language. I have very strong language around this. If you do not work very hard to figure out who your dream 100 are, you are a fool. You are being a fool. And I, I, I don't use that word lightly. This is a, you must know if you cannot put a name to your ideal client, it's probably, you probably haven't gone far enough yet. If you can't say it's Gary, it's definitely Gary. Gary is my ideal client and Elizabeth isn't. And here's why and why not. Like that's the level that you need to be at. You know, what's really interesting is I'm, I'm imagining how, how I might do this. Mm. And it's something that, I recognize in myself, but I see it in others as well. It's not what happens if it doesn't work. It's what actually happens if it works. What happens if I suddenly have these conversations with people that intimidate me? I'm scared to sell. I'm going to have to deliver my product now. Oh, what yeah. It's a True. big success. Mm-hmm. And actually that self-sabotaging starts to creep in as well. But I, yes. for the listener, you, you mentioned the safe. I have done this myself. I, oh, nice. You can have this for some of your clients with, in, okay. in agency land, but I used to run what was essentially a digital marketing agency. And when mm-hmm. I saw a company that I wanted to work with and I knew they had a fairly crappy website, I would have one of my designers design a, a homepage mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. And I would then have that printed out. So it was about four feet high. And about <laughs> yes. and a half feet wide. I would mount mm-hmm. it on a thick foam board and I would have it mm-hmm. couriered to the office yeah. because yeah. there's some interesting internal dynamics in these organizations that it's always somebody's job to say no to you on the phone, but it's mm-hmm. nobody's job to throw something out. So I love that. Yes, that's a good point. Nobody is authorized to throw expensive looking things out. So it's <laughs> going to lie around until the boss walks past it and says, what, what's that? Uh, uh-huh. Some company sent it in. Get them in. It looks fantastic. And it worked about 90%. I love it. Yeah. So this, I'm, I'm very aware of the time. I'm going to have to finish soon. And I'm pretty sure with your permission, this is going to end up being a part one of many. Because I've oh, really- wow. I'd love to. Yeah. About sales where we're so well aligned. But I think this is an important question for people. That when you actually have the right person on the call mm-hmm. and- you manage to move the conversation to your products and services. Mm -hmm. What's a good success rate? Founders in a well warmed up funnel should be selling between 40 and 80%. It's a very wide range. If you're going above 80%, 
you are not growing fast enough. You need to cast the gates wider open. You need to accept some un, some slightly less qualified calls. That if if you're closing above eighty percent, that indicates fear to me, a, a, a founder mindset issue. But if a good founder, a, a founder selling decently well, using some founder magic and and making some dirty deals. Like I say, founder fuel runs dirty. We have all the authority in the world to make up a deal on the spot and to, to change our fulfillment and do all that kind of stuff. So a founder selling with referrals, like who's, who's using referrals well, they should be closing 60 to 80% consistently. If they're closing less than that, they're going to have a very hard time closing on a cold traffic funnel. Going from warm referrals down to cold traffic, you can slash your close rate by two thirds pretty easily. So you need to be, you've got a lot to work on as you build that cold traffic funnel. So, but a founder on a cold traffic funnel, if you're starting in that 20% range and getting up to about the, you know, 40 to 60%, you're going to be fine with that. 40 to 60% is what I look for, for founder. Once the founder can do that, as long as you are growing, as long as you're truly in growth mode and hiring, I use the word scaling very gingerly because scaling to me is different than growth. Scaling is the inflection point where you can grow faster and faster and faster. It's a curve. It's not a straight line. So I, I think that word gets overused, but if you're hitting the point of scaling rather than growth, then you definitely need to be closing in that 40 to 60% range so that you can hire a salesperson because they're going to take a hit on their close. They don't have the same authority to make a deal as you have or to know what's in the package. They don't have the same knowledge. The, the founder has an intimate sell by sell feeling of what's happening in the business. This is very consistent. This happens with farmers, with insurance agents, with with Elon Musk. I mean, it doesn't matter. They have a better picture and visceral sense of what's happening in the business than anyone else does. Maybe not yeah. CEO, but founder CEO always does. And you cannot transfer that feel for some reason. So don't expect it to transfer. Just expect to take a hit on close ratio when you're putting salespeople in. So yeah, if you get into those ratio ranges, then that means that, okay, I'm in the ranges where I can hire, where I can grow. I might be able to scale from, from this foundational set of numbers here. Yeah. Then I'm doing all right. I'm happy with that. I was a bit concerned because I'm, I'm, I'm up maybe the 75%. So I'm not over the 80. So it's not entirely, it's not entirely fear there, but there is a lot of fear. I, I, let me let me walk that back so that I I don't have to feel like I'm almost insulting you. Um, no. For high growth mode founders, if they're closing above eighty percent, there's a problem. That's right. that's what I should say. If you're if you're more like laptop lifestyle or freelancer or freelancer with friends, like you don't have huge plans for growth, that's totally okay. So there we go. Now I now I feel better. All right. I probably leave this conversation more motivated and inspired about sales than I have with anybody I've ever spoken about sales. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm honored. It, Thank you. In a really, really practical conversation. And I hope the listeners got as much out of it as I have. And we're going to need to have you back because I'd like to talk a lot more about the sales mindset side of things. I think we've got some good orientation around the processes today, but there's just so much more. I'd love to. And with your pedigree, you speak with a lot of authority, both mm. from the practical side and also the mindset side. If somebody's listening, thinking, I want to go deeper, I want more Jeremy Pope, how can they do that? They can visit our resources page, which should have several working opt-ins on it, uh, salescalloverhaul.com slash resources. And I must always remember my final question. What's one thing you do now that you wish you'd started five years ago? I wish I had prioritized far, far better. And I wish that I had accepted that there are many, many things in business that are almost purely distractions at my current stage. And that they are, I wish I'd accepted that that fear is a much more powerful and sneaky, ambushy kind of motivator 
than I admitted way back then, because I would have been able to expose it to myself and move the needle on only the big things much more frequently, much more powerfully, much more effectively. That is the the biggest thing. That's a really, really good answer. Jeremy, thank you so much for your time today. You have been an awesome guest. If you're still listening, then don't forget, you can subscribe to this podcast and I would warmly encourage you to do that. If you have enjoyed this episode, then you will love the personal brand business roadmap. It's 50 pages of everything you will need to start, fix, or just, you know, start, scale, or fix your expert business. You can tap the link in the show notes or visit amplifyme.agency forward slash roadmap. If you did enjoy the show, then I would welcome you to leave a five-star review. That's five, not two or three. Review wherever you listen to podcasts as it really makes a massive difference to the show's reach. Thank you again for listening. Jeremy, thank you for your time. You've been awesome. And see you all next week. Thank you.